the FBI assesses that domestic terrorism is by far the greatest terrorist threat uh, to the United States right now. It's not foreign terrorist organizations. Furthermore, and this to me is even more striking, for the first time probably ever, certainly in my lifetime, our allies overseas view the United States as an exporter of terrorism. They are as worried about the terrorist organizations that are American grown as they are about the terrorist organizations that we used to pull our hair out over. And that is such a damning indictment of what's gone wrong in this country and our, our inability to stand up to it and to tell the truth about it and to tolerate the misinformation that feeds these organizations. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Now, I don't do a whole lot of gushing, but there are times when I really want to rave about something, and today is one of those days. I just saw the documentary Against All Enemies, and it is so impressive. Against All Enemies is a film you can watch on Netflix or Amazon about why U.S. military veterans would end up taking violent action against a country they swore an oath to protect, and basically why they would think they were patriots for doing it. It's an absolutely spectacular film that has been so well-crafted that it leaves you with a true understanding of where we sit with this violent extremist movement in America. This film explores how groups like the Proud Boys and Three Percenters and Oath Keepers are often organized and led by these highly trained American military veterans and what a threat this poses to the United States. This is not a feel-good film, but it's one that it's absolutely worth your time, and there wasn't a single second where I felt like picking up my phone or multitasking while I was watching it. It is that gripping. To join us today to talk about the film, we have Ken Harbaugh. Ken is a former Navy pilot and mission commander who has helped build and lead several national and internationally recognized veteran organizations, including the amazing Team Rubicon. Ken is a passionate advocate for his fellow veterans, and his writing has been everywhere from the New York Times to the Atlantic to the Yale Journal of International Law. He is also the recipient of the 2020 Hoorah Award, which is given annually to the American veteran who exemplifies service after the military. He was a commentator for NPR's All Things Considered, host the Top 100 History podcast, Warriors in Their Own Words, and the YouTube series Burn the Boats. But today we're going to talk to Ken about the award-winning documentary of which he is a producer and co-writer called Against All Enemies, and then you're going to go and watch it. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, former mission commander, veterans advocate, and writer-producer Ken Harbaugh. Welcome, Ken. It's great to be here, Lee. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you for coming. First of all, I want you to know that we had already made plans to have this conversation and have you on the show when a friend of mine called me to tell me that I had to watch this film Against All Enemies. And I was like, that's hilarious because I'm having him on the show, right? And she's like, oh my God, you're going to love it. It's so good. And it made me laugh because she's right. You have created such an amazing film here. Thanks. Well, I had an amazing team behind me, uh, the director, Charlie Sadoff. We had Sebastian Younger co-producing and he is one of the most renowned and well-respected war correspondents in America today. And, you know, we had a story that we just thought was too important not to tell from the veterans' perspective about why so many of my buddies are being drawn into these extremist organizations. Absolutely. And I saw you and Sebastian on the Daily Show recently. And one of the things you were saying to Desi Lidecker was that she was right. The film is incredibly sobering and in many ways quite terrifying. But it's also kind of essential because this is the reality of what we're dealing with in America. Our democracy is truly under attack. There is this organized effort by people who have the skills to make it happen, supported by people who have the money and power to see it done. So this film kind of lays out how imperative it is that we become acutely aware of the danger we're actually in. That's right. And I think we do a good job at explaining the historical lead up to the moment we're in, that this has happened before. I mean, one of the mic drop moments in the film is when the historian Kathleen Ballou, who literally wrote the book on this phenomenon of veterans coming home from war and visiting the violence they experienced in battle on the country they're returning to, she has documented beyond any question of a doubt that 
veterans join extremist groups in larger numbers after warfare. They did it after World War I, after World War II. I mean, the KKK itself grew out of the Civil War, was founded by Confederate veterans, initially as a social club, but then obviously as a terrorist organization. The mic drop moment is when she says, we know all this to be true. What we don't know is what happens to this phenomenon after the longest wars in America's history. Membership in the KKK surged after World War II, which was four years. We were at war for 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, millions of veterans coming home, many of whom don't have the, the reception or the pathways into, into constructive outlets for their angst, for their desire for camaraderie, and they join these groups. You know, the vast majority of American veterans, and we really want to say that, don't join these militia or extremist groups. But the film kind of highlights that there is this thing that really attracts this type of man to this type of group. And of course, when we talk about this type of group, we're talking about groups like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, Patriot Front, Three Percenters, these kind of white nationalists, Christian nationalists, often very misogynistic far-right groups. And what you're talking about in the film is how these groups actively are recruiting veterans because veterans have the training and the capacities and the capabilities that other men might not have. Veterans typically follow orders well. They don't question their superiors. And they kind of come in with this built-in sense of respect from our society. And they can also be a little bit lost, right, and looking for purpose. And one of the former military men that you have in the film says his mental health was so deeply affected by the wars he had been a part of that he said he found it hard to think of anything positive after his tours. I think about that all the time. Like if you've gone to war and you come home and then you look around at this regular world and it no longer really makes sense to you, you, you come back, it doesn't make sense, and then you're vulnerable and you're seeking a purpose, you're seeking something that makes you feel like it all makes sense again. And then that's what leads people to these groups. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you you began with that acknowledgement that we're not talking about most vets. We're talking about a small fraction but a dangerous fraction. In the military, they're called force multipliers because right. they bring a level of skill and training and frankly, cachet that far exceeds their numbers. So you have a couple of well-trained veterans in, in a group. They can magnify the impact of that group. And we saw this on January 6th. The tactical stacks, those are the formations of people working their way through the crowds to breach the doors, to get inside, those were led by veterans. A lot of them were oath keepers. And when you recognize what they're actually doing in specifically targeting for recruitment, these veterans, it is really, really scary. And frankly, a lot of these veterans are being manipulated. I absolutely think they should be held accountable. The ones who perpetrated acts of violence on January 6th should be in jail. But it is incumbent upon us to think more broadly about the moral burden, where it should lie on the people who know better, the Josh Hawley's, the Ted Cruz's, the J.D. Vance's of the world, who absolutely know better and for cynical political reasons, provoke these people into acts of violence and then in Hawley's case, run like hell when things get hairy. Yeah, right. I mean... Oh, God, you mentioned a bunch of these congressmen and senators and, uh, you know, but it's also people who are out of the military, like General Michael Flynn, right? right? Like, I think of him all the time. I don't understand how he is still out here preaching such hate against our country. And he's doing it under the moniker of general, you know, a three-star general with all this intelligence information. And he can use these skills to give a validity to a movement that doesn't deserve that validity. And you kind of get this sense uh, from the film itself, particularly, that these militia groups are attracting these vulnerable people because we, we mess them up in combat, then we basically release them back into our society with a very limited safety net. We have tons of money for war, but not really tons of money for vets that come back. And then we have these men looking for a brotherhood that they might miss, looking for a purpose that they might miss. And then we use these people in high levels of society, these Michael Flynn's and these J.D. Vance's and you know these people that have served in the military and like you said, should know better. And they say, well, they must know. And I'm used to following commands. I'm used to saying, well, my superiors know. And these guys are telling me that the you know, election's been stolen, that these people are taking my country. Like, how else are they supposed to react other than the way they are reacting? That's right. And that is what makes this situation different. 
and I would argue more dangerous than other insurrectionist, anti-government, terroristic movements we've faced in the past. We have had internal divisions and violent movements in this country since our founding. But you have to go back a long ways to find a terrorist movement that has the cover of a major political party, which is what right. the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and other groups like that have today. I mean, the Proud Boys was name-checked by the president behind a presidential podium on a debate stage when he told them to stand by in the event that he lost the election. That's an organization that was deemed a terrorist entity by Canada. You probably have to go back to the ascent of the KKK in the 20s in the Deep South to find an analog of a terrorist organization that had a major political party covering for it. In that case, it was a regional party. It was the Southern Democrats, and it ushered in a reign of terror that lasted generations. We have now a national party, the Republican Party, calling perpetrators of an insurrection, people who beat cops with flagpoles, hostages and martyrs. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, this isn't the first time that a major political party has been co-opted by a violent extremist group. You're talking about the KKK, right? Your film goes into detail about it, how the Klan was really an extraordinary example of a successful militia group that could infiltrate a political party and honestly is still kind of successful to this day. Like the parties might have changed. It might not be the Southern Democrats anymore, but that group of people that would have been against the removal of slavery, that is still in a major political party in America, just happens to be the Republican Party. But the KKK were able to keep black Americans from the polls and from voting for almost a hundred years, right? They, they were completely infiltrating American society. There's a, a shot that astounded me from your film with just hundreds of thousands of KKK members marching in formation down the mall of Washington. And I thought, how did I not know that that happened? You know, and the numbers of the KKK are, are astounding. And yet they're still in our society today. You know, watching the film, I kept thinking like, how the hell is Donald Trump the Republican nominee? Like, it feels insane because he's, he's organizing these malicious groups and he's still the leader of this party. Yeah, I think one of the things that most shocked me in diving into the history and into the, the present state of these militia organizations and we had extraordinary access. You've seen the film, but yeah, our yes. <laughs> our access into the Oath Keepers, those interviews with Stuart Rhodes. I had a text exchange myself with Stuart Rhodes um, that lasted several weeks until it went quiet, and I uh, turned on the news and realized he had been he had been rolled up. Good thing, good yeah. riddance. But I think some of these groups are beginning to realize that you know what, maybe we don't need to smash glass and break into the Capitol to take over the government. Let's take over a political party. Let's get our people elected to school boards. Let's co-opt people like Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene and potentially the next president of the United States. And that is where I think the real, real lasting damage to our democracy could happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these people aren't joining these groups out of nowhere. The people involved are very convinced that things are broken, that they're wrong, that they need to be fixed. And it's because the people at the very highest levels of power, including, as you said, the president himself, the former president in this case, tell them that it is. We have senators and congressmen and journalists who have given this movement a validity that I said earlier doesn't deserve. We had the great replacement theory already. We had racism. We had sexism. We had Christian nationalism. And then we got Trump's big lie and everything kind of took off, right? The whole thing to me just kind of shows the importance of the big lie and how the big lie was really what got its hooks into a lot of these people and their doubt in American democracy because it made people question if our democracy was working, if it was fair, if as they were told it was rigged, right? And of course the irony is the people telling everyone it's rigged are the people trying to rig it, right? So then we have these people who have all these skills and all these talents. And honestly, you know, I'm one of those people that stops people in the street and says, thank you for your service. You know, they have these people with validity to their names and they're out here fighting for the side of America. They're fighting against evil. Many of them are absolutely convinced that God himself is on their side. And so 
what are they supposed to do if all of these important people have told them that this is what they need to believe and they say, I have these skills and I need to join this cause because I am in the right. They think they're doing good. Someone in the movie said, these veterans' hearts are in the right place. They're doing the right thing. They just don't live in the world of truth anymore. Right, right. There's this moment where Congressman Jason Crow who was an army ranger, did 90 combat missions overseas. He was one of the few members of Congress trapped in the House gallery during the insurrection. They were able to get everyone else off the House floor. They were able to evacuate the Senate. He's trapped up there in the House gallery as they're trying to break down the doors and come in and kill him. And he had a revelation in that moment, realizing that there were veterans on the other side of that barrier, of that locked door. He thought to himself, how is it that we both swore the same oath to the Constitution? And it's because of the big lie. It's because of those leaders who know better, who are lying to those veterans, telling them they have to do this to save their country. When your president tells you that your democracy is being taken from you, when your political leaders, the Ted Cruz's and Josh Hawley's and J.D. Vance's of the world, the ones you listen to, tell you the same thing, I think that's what that interview we met when he said these people's hearts are in the right place. A lot of them thought they were the ones fighting for democracy because yeah. they had been lied to about the election, about these invented threats to democracy. And so they they took up arms. Yeah. I, we're literally living with different truths, you know, like truth for me is what can be proved. And I feel like truth for them at this point is what they are told or what they want to believe. And nowadays it doesn't even seem like there has to be be proof for them. Like they don't care if there's proof because if you show them proof of the opposite, they'll say that's a deep state problem. That's a fake news problem. That's not real. You had a gentleman in the film who's a three percenter who to me seemed like he probably never saw combat, that he got hurt in training. And now he just kind of wants to be the man. He wants to shoot things up, but he thinks he's the hero and he doesn't seem to be willing to listen to anyone else's realities other than his own. He's armed up. He's got his Bible. He's got his gun. He's out there, you know, leading rallies and talking about saving the country. I don't know what you think about this, but it seemed to me watching the film that here's a man who didn't quite make it in life or in the military. And now he wants to be in a group where he is the man and that makes him feel like he belongs. Does that feel right to you? It describes a significant percentage of right. these adherents to, to this ideology of the membership and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters. We had one executive producer on the project, a Navy SEAL, founder of Veterans for Responsible Leadership. I hope you put a link in the show description. It's a great group. He has observed that in some cases, the most dangerous insurrectionist is the one who didn't see combat. And you're right. describing that to a T in describing this character. General E is his you know, self-appointed moniker in the film. And he's trying to live out his fantasies of combat by recreating that at home. He never got to see it himself. That said, we profile or we at least show some former special forces operatives. There are some very serious hardened combat vets who have taken this ideology on as well. But a lot of them, I should say, are, are cosplay. They're just fantasizing about what combat would feel like. And that's, I think, where we get the civil war fetishization, which is really sick. You have these people longing for it, wanting to accelerate it. There's this whole movement, accelerationism. Uh, and yeah, that's something we really have to be on the lookout for. Absolutely. I mean, I found it striking that these men, and, and it was mostly men, who are speaking so seriously about the country being stolen and how unfair the elections were and these cheating politicians and the shattered American dream and these demons that are taking their democracy from them. And I, I just thought, this demon that they're chasing, these people that are fighting against their American values and the Constitution and their traitors to the country, it's them. Like, yeah. they are the enemy they fear. And you're watching it and you think, how come they can't see it? But of course they can't see it because they're living in a completely different world of truth where, like you said, these important people are telling them over and over again to use them, to use these people that we have trained, that took this oath, that went out to fight for American values around the world, and they have forgotten those values as they've come home. Yeah. Bill Crystal, 
makes the point in the film. And we worked hard to to try to talk to people on both sides, on every side of the ideological did, yeah. spectrum. You know, we talked to Denver Riggleman, former Republican congressman, Bill Crystal, obviously uh, worked for Dick Cheney. And he asks the, the rhetorical question, who has paid a price? Among those leaders who have fomented this kind of violence, which of them has paid a price? Has Mike Flynn really paid a price? No, he's actually gotten rich off of this. Has... Josh Hawley or J.D. Vance or Ted Cruz paid a price? No, they are perfectly content to tell others to charge the barricades and go to jail while they rake in the campaign donations and get reelected. Yeah, and nowadays power is the ultimate status symbol. And these, these men are just getting more powerful while they're having these foot soldiers do their work for them. And I, I feel like this idea here is that we have to take these people and these groups incredibly seriously, that we do ourselves a disservice to pretend that these are just a bunch of yahoos, even those Patriot Front guys, you know, in their khaki pants and their polo shirts who are almost comical as they go through their wannabe badass drills and march in towns and get caught in the back of U-Hauls, you know, but it's not funny because they're not harmless. They're part of a bigger, scarier picture that we need to pay attention to. We saw on January 6th, what we're seeing with these growing militia movements, What the film reminds us is that insurgency really is a way to power, right? It is an act of war. And January 6th and the events that continue to happen around the country are all part of a bigger plan. And we, the regular public, often don't see the bigger plan because it's just below the surface. But these leaders, who are the ones not going to jail, they do see the bigger purpose. And we need to pay attention. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have right now, would you be able to tell me? How about how much they cost? Most people think they could, and most people are wrong. In fact, 75% of people have subscriptions that they have completely forgotten about. 75%. It is amazing how much money these companies are making off of us, and we don't even know. And that is why Rocket Money is so helpful. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. It shows you all your subscriptions in one place, and if there's something you don't want or can no longer afford, then Rocket Money can help you cancel it with just a few taps. Rocket Money will even try and negotiate for you to get a refund on the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money does the rest. It's a terrific service, which is probably why Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving their members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. So stop wasting money on things you don't use and cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. That's rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. Politics Girl has a new sponsor, Birch Living. We just got a Birch Living mattress from my brother-in-law and it arrived and they're setting it up and I can't wait to hear their feedback. We got them a Birch mattress because they are stylish and comfortable, but most importantly in this world where we want to do right by the planet, they are environmentally conscious. Plus, Birch's non-toxic mattresses are made right here in America and are crafted with natural and organic materials that have been sustainably sourced. Unlike synthetic mattresses, the wool in Birch mattresses makes them hypoallergenic. Birch sources not only the best quality materials like organic fair trade cotton, organic wool, natural latex to create these luxurious mattresses, they're designed to give you the best night's sleep possible. Every Birch mattress is constructed with non-toxic materials and helps focus on breathability that helps you keep cool at night. Plus, Birch knows there's no better way to test out a new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home, which is why they offer a 100-night risk-free trial to try out your new Birch mattress and see how your body adjusts. And once you love it, Birch stands behind the quality of their product by giving each mattress a 25-year warranty. Birch mattresses are shipped directly from their manufacturing facility to your door free of charge. The mattresses arrive rolled up in a box and they are simple to set up. And for a show about American politics that highly favors American-made products by American workers, I am pleased to say that Birch mattresses are all American-made. So if you're looking for a new mattress, why not give Birch a try? Right now, Birch is giving 20% off all mattresses and two free EcoRest pillows at birchliving.com slash politicsgirl. That's birchliving.com slash politicsgirl. Sleep better 
with Birch. Before we go today, I wanted to tell anyone who hasn't yet heard that I have written a book. I think we can all sense something's gone wrong here in America, but if we're being honest, we might not fully understand it. And I don't think people should feel bad about that. We don't really have proper civics anymore. Cable news is allowed to lie to us and everything else seems to be for profit. So truly knowing what's going on has become increasingly difficult. And at the end of the day, how do you fix something if you don't understand what's broken? Which is why I do this podcast, it's why I do the rants, and it's why I wrote this book. The book is called A Return to Common Sense, and I consider it a political book for non-political people. It's a book that explains how American government and society works, and it sets up a framework for how it could work moving forward. The book is based around six American principles, six ideals that no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, I think we can all agree make America America. By using these principles as guideposts, I believe we have the opportunity to find our way out of this mess we're currently in and start moving towards something much better. It's a simple and easy read that will tell you what you need to know and give you a direction for where we need to go. It'll be in stores September 17th, right in time for the election, but it would really help if you considered pre-ordering it now. That kind of stuff really matters in the book world, and I want this book to be a success just like I want America to be a success. As I say all the time, I started the Politics Girl Project because I believe deeply in this country. I know we're in a terrible place right now, but we've got everything we need for a hell of a comeback story. So consider ordering A Return to Common Sense wherever you get your books, and let's get to fixing this country together. Thank you so much for considering it. I'm very excited. It's my first book. These leaders, who are the ones not going to jail, they do see the bigger purpose, and we need to pay attention. These groups and their leaders look at January 6th as a massive success, a massive success. Yeah. This actually isn't in the film. It, it's come out of interviews I've done uh, since then with some of the experts we, we talked to in the film. Membership in radical extremist organizations since January 6th has gone up. The overall number of organizations may have decreased, but that's because of consolidation. They are drawing more and more people into their ranks than ever before. And it's because they can point to January 6th and say, look what a small group of people were able to accomplish. And then they can quote the, the former president and his lieutenants and say that people who carried that out are being called hostages and martyrs by potentially the next president of the United States. It has been a phenomenal recruiting tool for these groups. I mean, January 6th was kind of just the first step in a real insurrection. It wasn't the end of something. It was the beginning. And we kind of need to wake up and smell the fascism, I suppose. I mean, there's a professor in the film. She's, she's just amazing. And she points out how the public, the American public, has really lost sight of the size of this movement and the seriousness of this threat, which is why we need a film like this to remind us. You were talking about how Bill Kristol is in the movie. Bill Kristol was a looming figure in the Republican Party. Huge, huge Republican. And he points out that, you know, two thirds of Republicans voted to not certify the election after the insurrection. He said we should be seeing what those Republicans did on 1 6 as just as astounding, but almost more astounding than the violence itself, because we have these really important people in our society, these members of Congress, the, the president telling us over and over again that it is unfair, that it is rigged. They have no evidence of this and they keep saying it. And it is impossible for our country to come together if one of our two major parties is simply committed to lying to people. And that's why you're having these groups increase in size. And these foot soldiers, these guys out here that we see doing the, the drills who are storming the Capitol, they don't know that they're being lied to. We, we from the outside can see that it seems quite obvious, but they don't know. And aren't they responsible to fight back? If you don't know, they, they feel like they're doing the, the country a service. And your film points to similarities between our extremist groups and groups like Al-Qaeda, who weren't taken seriously at first either. But then when they were, it was basically too late. You know, here comes this charismatic leader who stirred everything up. And then look what happened with Al-Qaeda. And that's kind of what we need to pay attention to here because it absolutely could happen. Yeah, it absolutely could happen. It is happening. I go back to this idea of making sure we assign the moral burden in in a thoughtful way, because a lot of the membership of these groups, 
like you've said, they believe they're doing the right thing, but they are they are absolutely being lied to. And not only are they being lied to by leaders within the Republican Party from the top on down, they are being provoked into acts of violence. When the president said to the Proud Boys to stand by, I mean, that was a clear incitement to me. When you have violent perpetrators of attacks on cops being called martyrs and hostages, that's another incitement. And now you have a Republican party. I'm not talking about the leadership. I'm talking about the rank and file. Nearly a majority of them now believe that political violence might be necessary in America to restore the country that they feel has been taken away from them. So it's not just about the lies, it's about the provocations. And you're right, unless the Republican Party can figure itself out or be so thoroughly rebuked in upcoming elections, we're not going to come together as a country. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it really does come down to they have to be absolutely smoked at the ballot box. It has to be such a decisive victory against this violent extremist Christian nationalist fascist movement that that there's no question that this isn't what the people want and that people are going to fight back. I mean, it kind of doesn't matter uh, what group is doing it, whether it's an Al-Qaeda or a homegrown terrorism here. The whole concept of these grievance narratives, right? These people took from you. These people are bad. These people must be punished. It's powerful stuff, especially to unhappy people seeking purpose, right? As someone in your film says, grievance narrative is all made up, but it works, right? Yeah. The people instigating and provoking these folks don't want to build anything. They don't want to improve anything. They don't believe in progress. They believe in simply having the same people to hate. And that that's what binds them. When I talk to members of these organizations, they don't really know what uh, the GOP platform is. Well, at the last convention, they actually didn't There's have not much a, platform. Of a platform. It was simply support Trump <laughs> so at all costs. much of a platform. Right. Yeah. Uh, they, don't, they don't know what the foundational values or virtues of, of the party are. They simply know that that party hates the same people they do. And that is powerful stuff. That is really powerful stuff. And uh, we see what happens in other countries historically when that is the animating force behind a political movement. And it's, it's devastating. It is devastating. I mean, watching the film, it seems like the experts that you interviewed, and you really did have just such an amazing group of people in this film, which I can't say enough about. It, they seem to see that civil war in America, mass violence is actually not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. Stan McChrystal, who actually worked with Mike Flynn in a in a prior life uh, when he was the commander. That was quite striking. I know. The yeah. fact that we got him on on camera um, disavowing Mike Flynn and, and his cynical attempts to manipulate his followers. But Stan McChrystal has seen insurrection and civil war and terrorism close up. He led America's and the coalition's counterterrorism efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he says, you know, I think things could be far worse or get far worse than most Americans can imagine. I could see a civil war. That's a a direct quote from the film. And this is from someone who has been in the middle of them. Yeah. I mean, the people that are running these groups, the really high up people, uh, not even the Stuart Rhodeses who had his military background and Yale law degree, who was really a hell of a leader of the Oath Keepers, but he's still going to jail, right? I'm talking about people like General Flynn or even Steve Bannon and Roger Stone, these guys behind the curtain, Wizard of Ozing, the evilness, and then everyone surrounding and enabling Trump, right? This isn't about little skirmishes throughout the country or what damage these small groups can do. At the end of the day, it's all about undermining democracy. They want to get back in charge by any means necessary. And once they're in charge, these are the people that will decide who is American and who is not. They're the ones who will decide who gets included in our society and who does not. They will make the rules, all the rules. And you look at people like Flynn, right, who, like I said, is is using the fact that he was a military veteran, a general, as part of his identity. He goes by general everywhere, as one of the people in the film says, like it's his first name. You know, he uses general as his identity. And he is the one that's helping us slide into authoritarianism. And so what the film kind of said to me is, 
we should be scared. You know, we should be aware that we need to ask ourselves if we're comfortable with this level of violence and this level of violence being supported by this one whole political party. And you can be sure, it's a 100% guarantee that the people we're talking about are going to have positions of enormous power should there be a second yeah. Trump administration. And I think back to 2020 and how close we came to the Insurrection Act being invoked, how close we came to active duty military engaging American civilians. And but for a handful of people in uniform protecting that safeguard, but for Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, saying, I'm not going to transmit that order. I'm not going to activate or I'm not going to tell the combat commander to activate the 82nd Airborne. We could have easily been there. One of the most striking examples to me, it's not in the film, we learned about it since, but it's a, a Marine first lieutenant, a very junior officer, Mike Pence's son, who sat his father down before January 6th and said, Dad, you have to do your duty. You swore the same oath to the Constitution that I did. If you think about our democracy coming down to a handful of people in uniform and realizing that if Trump wins again, those people aren't going to be there. He and the people around him have learned their lesson. They're going to dismantle those safeguards as quickly as they can. You're going to have sycophants in every position that acted as a safeguard the first time around. And the Flynn's and the Bannon's and the Miller's, they're going to be the ones calling the shots. That's how democracy dies. I think we ultimately have to deal with the fact that we have this homegrown American terrorist organization growing in this country. And I don't think people are prepared for it. It seems like there is a growing number of people willing to use their military training against their fellow citizens, looking to use the American military against our fellow citizens. And the film points out that in many ways, there's not much we can do about it because we don't have domestic terrorist laws really in this country. So there's no proper way to kind of handle it. There's things that for regular terrorism laws, they have things like material support charges so that those are people that are charged with helping the terrorist, helping them get weapons, helping them get access, helping them do that. But we don't have those laws for domestic terrorists. And then everyone that is paying attention will tell you that domestic terrorism is one of the biggest threats, if not the biggest threat to America today. So it's almost like we trained our own domestic terrorists we paid them to get the skills they needed in the military to come home and use it against us. And we have some of the biggest, most important people, like you said, who aren't going to be the Mark Millies, who are going to be the General Flynn's that are going to be calling the shots if we allow another Trump presidency to happen. Yeah, the FBI assesses that domestic terrorism is by far the greatest terrorist threat uh, to the United States right now. It's not foreign terrorist organizations. Furthermore, and this to me is even more striking, for the first time probably ever, certainly in my lifetime, our allies overseas view the United States as an exporter of terrorism. They are as worried about the terrorist organizations that are American grown as they are about the terrorist organizations that we used to pull our hair out over. And that is such a damning indictment of what's gone wrong in this country and our, our inability to stand up to it and to tell the truth about it and to tolerate the misinformation that feeds these organizations. Yeah. I think people can probably remember the whole Timothy McVeigh trial and and the Oklahoma City bombing. And, and Timothy McVeigh is another one of those military men that never quite saw combat and didn't quite get there, couldn't quite make it the way he wanted to. And he was bitter and he was angry and he combined with a friend of his. And and then at the end of the day, he couldn't be charged with terrorism, right. right? And people keep saying, like, if his name had been Muhammad, we would have had no trouble charging him with terrorism. That this is something we need to address as a country, that this is a, like you're saying, we've now got this export of terrorism in the world from America to the rest of the world. And people should be very concerned about it. I mean, concerned is probably the wrong word. Scared, I think, is the best word. Scared is probably good because it's definitely necessary because fear is a terrific motivator. We need to understand that this is a real threat. And if we don't want to become this kind of weird dystopian future that these people would have us live in, we have to be fighting back. Uh, you have one of the people in the film and he talks about the people that scare him the most are these young veterans, these young veterans who are Gen Z, who grew, basically served at a time that we were at peace and they signed up to fight and never got to fight. And then 
they're at home wanting to be GI Joes and thinking that, you know, the president isn't the president and people have stolen things from them and they're just, I keep saying, dying to use the guns, you know, and that is terrifying. Yeah. Well, this is where individuals can make a difference because frankly, redirecting someone like you just described off of that path into an extremist organization, let's say they're at that crossroads in their lives where they are about to make a decision as one of the people in our our film found himself between joining an extremist organization or doing something else positive with their with their training and their experience like team rubicon uh which retrains vets to do disaster relief or veterans for responsible leadership often that decision comes down to a conversation with somebody who cares about that veteran I wish it was podcasts like this. Um, I mean, it can start the conversation. <laughs> Films like Against All Enemies can start the conversation. But ultimately, it ends with a loved one, a parent, a sibling, a battle buddy, talking to them over the holidays, you know, over dinner uh, and and challenging some of their, their paranoias and misconceptions uh, about the country they swore to defend. Yeah. And it's a hard conversation for people to have. I often say with politics in general, we are responsible for our people, you know, that we have to have those tough conversations at the dining room table. We have to challenge our dad that's saying something racist. We have to say something to our hairdresser that says it doesn't matter if I vote or not. You know, like we're the ones that have to speak up to the people in our lives because they're more likely to listen to us than any person on the news, any person on the radio. They're, they're going to listen to the people closest to them. And like you said, if you have a veteran in your life and you see them going in a direction, it has actually beholden on us to take our veterans and say, hey, let me see if we can direct you to a different place. Because I, I, I think this is one of the fallouts of us not having more places for people to gather anymore. You know, we don't have these third places. We don't have the Shriners Clubs and the Lions Clubs. Those are sort of all gone. We don't talk to our neighbors. We live in this sort of isolation chambers. And that drives us to extremism because we often end up online and online we know will feed us a bunch of things in a row that end up driving us somewhere. And people seek camaraderie. They seek friendship. They seek groups and the military offered them that. And then that was taken from them. Right. So I think we have to reach out to our veterans and say, you know, like, look, this is a much longer battle. This, the fight is far from over. It could last years. It could last decades, but it's going to take us coming back together. It's going to take our politicians working for unity and our journalists telling us the truth, but it's going to take us at home talking to our people who have someone in our life that did put their life on the line for our country. And helping redirect them back to a place of positivity. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that would be so important. 100%. It, it, it all comes down to those individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with that person in your life you care about. You, know, you, you want to see them make the right choice. On the political side, it also comes down to holding the liars accountable. And we all have some power there. We can all vote or at least be active in in spreading the truth about our our representatives the good ones and the bad ones when it comes down to helping the people in your life make the right decisions that's an individual conversation <laughs> beyond that we have to vote and and every time yeah vote every time and advocate not just vote tell people to vote help people vote get people registered do all the things that move the needle along as i was saying in my introduction i i don't actually often gush about things but i want to tell you this is a beautiful film a film that everyone in this country really should watch and if you are in my audience and you're listening to this i'm not kidding when i say this if you care about america if you care about american democracy this is worth 2 hours of your time to truly understand where we are as a country this isn't what the entertainment news tells us this is what's really happening and this documentary captures it so beautifully. So I want to say congratulations to you, Ken, and to everyone involved. Thank you for making this film. And thank you so much for joining us today to talk about it. Please tell people how they can find the film and also how to follow your work moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lee, for having me. The film thank is on you. Amazon and Apple. And you know this as well as anybody, reviews make a huge difference. They feed the algorithms. I wish we didn't have to play that game, but if you watch it, Think about giving us uh, a review. We're number one on Apple, which is incredible. The top doc for a week, we were actually beating Barbie and Oppenheimer and Dune. Uh, we want every American to see this. So if you can help us get to that same spot on Amazon, would 
love the help from your audience. I'm on Twitter. I refuse to call it X at, uh, at team, <laughs> you me both, babe. At team <laughs> underscore Harbaugh. Uh, and I'm with you on the Midas Touch Network hosting the Burn the Boats podcast. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you know, obviously we are at a very pivotal point in our country's history. And I think it's just, it's beholden on us to take control of the situation through our votes, through our advocacy and through our people. And I think that your film really lays out what the problem is and where we really stand in American history. And I think if we have our eyes open, then we can actually start making changes that will take us in a far better direction than we are now. Thank you so much, Lee. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Ken. So that was Ken Harbaugh reminding us that the membership in these violent extremist organizations is going up, especially with our veterans, that America is now considered an exporter of terrorism, and that is only made possible by the lies and ambitions of people in the highest ranks of power who are using our citizens to undermine the very fabric of American democracy for their own aims. Not only do we need to vote these people out, we need to take responsibility for the people in our lives who might be considering going down the wrong path and help redirect them somewhere where they can fill the void in a more productive and patriotic way. I wanna thank Ken for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go and watch Against All Enemies. And when you're done, thank Ken for his service by reviewing his film. Let's reward him for being such a magnificent example of using the honor, valor, and skills the American military teaches to actually make the world a better place. Thank you for listening. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.